16, including myself, currently on. So that seems like a fair number. Okay. Uh, if you want, I can wait a minute or two. Well, let me just let me just introduce you and talk okay. a little bit about uh, these research conversations that uh, Laura Girardot, Brian French, and I have put together for this year. And this is the final one. And the idea behind this is that they are like a, a conversation. We wanted it to be much more interactive. And Jonah said that he welcomes people uh, asking questions uh, during the presentation. We can do that either by, by asking or put, raising your hand or, or speaking, or you can use the chat function on Zoom to do that. And so uh, I would like to, I'm very, very interested in this topic. It's, it's perfect for what we're going through at this time. And I think that uh, these kind of considerations are good. So uh, Jonah Firestone, uh, teaching and learning via virtual reality is at least the learning real. <laughs> Take it away, Jonah. OK, so uh, I'm Jonah Firestone. I'm a, a assistant professor in, obviously, College of Ed on the Tri-Cities campus, and I run uh, and I'm a PI for the Simeon Lab, which has nothing to do with monkeys. It is the Simulation and Integrated Media for Instruction, Assessment, and Neurocognition Lab. I just needed a name that I had already had a website for. Um, so this lab basically uses VR, AR, 3D printing, and some neuro assessment to look at learning and also how teachers and students utilize things like VR, AR, mixed reality and other educational technology tools and also if learning actually occurs in these environments so the first thing i want to do is because it's in the name eh, i want to talk about whales so what i'd like you to do very briefly if someone would like to volunteer i would like you to or a couple of you i could put you in rooms but there are not that many of you to describe to the group what a whale looks like to as if someone had never seen a whale before and if i will volunteer tell you in a second if no one jumps on the grenade it's a large humped creature that has a tail and uh often has a spout it's very large and it's uh lives in the ocean okay so if you were an alien from another planet, would you be able to accurately, based on that description, draw a whale? No. No. So no. OK, well, let me see if we can help you a little bit. What if I provided you with some text? Um, and on my screen, the text is completely covered by a bunch of other things. So we're going to have to move stuff around. Whales are creatures of the open ocean. They feed, mate, give birth, suckle, and raise their young. And see, so extreme is their adaptation of life. Ugh, it's already kind of boring, and I totally stole it from Wikipedia. So does this help you in your, could you, using this, be able to describe a whale to somebody from another planet? So what would help in this situation? This is Seeing a whale. Seeing a whale. So, yeah. So does this help? So we all know the old adage that the picture's worth a thousand words, but when we're starting to talk about the 21st century, we, we have environments such as VR and AR that can be worth a thousand pictures. And so a lot of this uh, research that I do is looking at how things that are interactive can work better than text, can work better than lecture, or not, as the case may be. Because in reality, there are a lot of claims about VR and AR technology in education that aren't necessarily substantiated. At least there has been very little research done on them. So to discuss this, we need to kind of talk about what virtual reality actually is. So virtual reality is an immersive environment that surrounds a participant. And when we say immersive, it's not just sight, um, though it is a, a major component to uh, experiencing, but also feel, they're haptic, usually haptic components to it. Usually you have um, handles that have some type of gyroscope in it to simulate weight. There's also sound, there's speakers that surround you. And it's a 360 degree environment that uh, can be mobile or stationary. Quite a lot of them you can move around, you can jump from place to place, you can also do it sitting at your desk. An example of this in the media is Ready Player One. If you've read the book or seen the movie, they're entering into a virtual reality environment. 
What VR is not, though, it's not Z space. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. Z space is a 3D simulation where you look at a monitor and wearing special 3D glasses creates a 3D kind of image you can look around, kind of like a 3D movie. It's not that. It's not in 2D. It's definitely in 3D. And it's not augmented reality. So there's a definitely a difference between virtual and, and augmented reality. So with ver the, other uh, the other thing we have is what is augmented reality? So augmented reality is a non-aversive three overlay uh, that either can be in front of you or can even surround multiple participants. It can be mobile or stationary. You can move it around. It's viewable in 360. So a typical example of augmented reality that adults seem to know is Pokemon Go. So Pokemon Go is the first big commercial use of um, augmented reality that a bunch of adults found fascinating and kids kind of found marginally interesting. And that's usually where I go to. Or it's also featured in a book by Werner Binge called Rainbow's End, if you really want to nerd, nerd out. AR is also not Z space. Um, AR is something that can be placed in various areas or can be overlain on top of existing material and like Z space. It's not in 2D, 2D and it's not in virtual reality. So typically what we look at our technology and our friends, is a comparison between the two. So in VR, in virtual reality, we have a very controlled environment, which is important for aspects of research. So I can, as a researcher who's programming these environments, I can control every aspect that the um, subject has and interacts with. It's usually single user, but ironically with more interaction. For example, you could be a single user in Tri-Cities interacting with a single user in Pullman. So while I will only have one headset, you, you can interact with everyone else who has a headset that happens to be on that platform. It's very difficult to produce. It's cost intensive. It takes a long time to produce something that looks realistic. Um, usually professional programs have to do this. And various products like HTC Vive, Google Car Cardboard, or Oculus Rift, which is a set I have here, are used. For augmented reality, it's a much more open environment. Um, basically, anyone can have it if you have your phone. You get your phone, you play, you can put an object in front of you that you see through the phone or through a special headset. Multiple users can use it at the same time, but there's less, ironically, interaction. So you might put it, let's say, a globe or a, a moon in front of you, and multiple users can all be seeing this interactive augmented moon, but they're only, they don't really interact with each other directly. Um, it's very open-ended, it's very cheap, it's easy to produce this type of material, and we'll show, I'll show you a couple of examples today. And you all already have it. If you have a smartphone, um, especially an iPhone, it's already built in. So do you guys have any questions at this point? As opposed to me just talking at a camera. No. Okay. Um, so these exist, VR versus AR exists on a continuum. On one end is the real world. So I will get in trouble with my philosophy class for that. Uh, then we end up with the idea of augmented reality where there's some immersion, you have an object in front of you that doesn't actually exist, but you can kind of see. Then you have this idea of mixed reality where you have some overlay, uh, some embeddedness, some immersion, but also you're seeing the real world. And then you have the idea of complete virtual reality, where everything that you're seeing and hearing and interacting with is completely virtual and non-existent. And so with this in mind, these are the kind of basic two types of technology that I typically use for this research. We can look at some of the things that I've actually done so far. Um, oh, so have you seen any have questions? Uh, between AR versus severe, meaning one is superior to the other. So the question is, have you seen any pedag uh, pedagogical differences between AR versus VR? And meaning this is one superior to the other in different settings? Yes. So um, it, um, it kind of, in different settings, so at older grades, and if you're looking at specific type of content and experience, it's very complex. Uh, you would say that VR is probably superior because you can really immerse somebody in complex situations that they wouldn't be able to deal with normally. AR is better for maybe less complex situations, less complex uh, content, but also has to do with issues of classroom management and issues of learning. 
Uh, so which came first, um, AR or VR in research? Uh, basically VR. So VR research has been around actually for quite a long time. If you're old like me, uh, you remember that VR was originally, there was a bunch of push for VR in the early 90s. And then even before that, in the 70s, they were talking about virtual reality, though it really wasn't what we consider virtual reality today. AR research has pretty brand new, um, mainly because the technology to do AR is coming hand in hand with uh, smartphones. So while you can have AR technology is incredibly expensive unless you do the type that's on smartphones. So now AR is being embedded in classrooms before it was mainly VR. So you could kind of look at the continuum went from the real world all the way to VR and it's been moving backwards since. So, yeah. Move forward. Okay. So I want to talk about a, a VR study that was done a few years ago. This is a pilot study. And it's a good introduction to the kind of things that uh, I've been looking at in the lab and that what other researchers have been, look at, researchers have been looking at across the nation for VR. Um, so we had a question, how does the modality of the learning environment impact the complexity of argu argumentative and summative writing samples? Meaning really which different, how does VR versus maybe text versus lecture or something else, how does that impact complexity of writing? And how do the results from the study program and form a larger uh, scale study targeted to younger students. So we started with these two questions. Um, and specifically, we were looking at a VR, um, using VR in classrooms because there are a lot of claims about it. Specifically, there are claims that if you do VR, it will replace teaching, it will replace text. Or if you do VR, learning will be better. And so a lot of technology companies make these claims with very few of them have been substantiated. Uh, a classic one is that Arizona State University has an entire VR suite for uh, microbiology. Uh, they presented it at several conferences. I've talked to ASU about this, but they've never actually assessed whether learning is impacted at all using this type of environment. Uh, and you're gonna find that a lot with the VR um, environments that are created commercially. It costs a lot of money just to get it started and very often ed tech companies are reticent to allow somebody to make a claim on whether it works or not. So um, we, what we did is that we took a, a text um, and a VR environment. The text was chosen because it was available, um, always convenient, and we, for, for the um, VR environment, we selected it because it was actually free. So we took a free off-the-shelf VR environment and we took a text that was readily available and we wanted to see which one would enhance writing and hopefully uh, reasoning about science. So the, the equipment that we used was an HTC Vive headset, which is runs about, um, at the time, $800, a computer with enhanced graphics and speed. The computers that I personally have in my lab are the fastest computers on the Tri-City campus. You do not need those types of computers, but I didn't want to replace them anytime soon. And we use what's called the Blue Reef Migration Demo Program. So it's a free demo program available off of Steam. So the participants we use, there are 15 participants. They were uh, screened for exclusion criteria. Um, so we excluded science majors. So we didn't want science majors. We didn't want people who might get motion sick or have seizures due to flashing lights. And of course people had deck injuries. So there were some physical constraints. And we also wanted people who were not already embedded within science and science discussions. Um, at the very end, we ended up with five doctoral students, six master level students, two undergrads and a staff member all participating in, in, this, in this example. One held a bachelor's of biology, but was enrolled in master's of business administration, so we kind of let that one go. Um, four participants were non-native English speakers, three men and 12 women in, in the final group. Um, it was in one of the laboratories, more than one of the laboratories, and we already talked about I already talked about the fact that you use HTC Vive and the computer. This is what I wanted to show you about the um, Blue Reef. So it's an immersive underwater reef environment where your uh, uh, participants are placed in an environment on a reef. You're completely underwater. You can look around. You can walk around uh, within certain constraints. You can reach out and touch things and fish, sea anemones, the sea turtles. They all interact with you. It takes about 
um, 10 minutes. So people feel that they're in there for half an hour because it's so immersive, you tend to lose track of time. And it looked kind of like this. This is my very poor uh, 2D version of it. So you have a whale coming by. Um, it, look, it is scaled to the same size. So when you reach out, there is a giant whale. Uh, what level is a Cam uh, Campbell text written as? It was a, essentially at a high school undergraduate level um, would be the text. Um, you can they, there were things like jellyfish that come by and you, remember you can reach out, you can touch these things. They react, they don't hurt. Um, I've been running the simulation for a while with, uh, with various groups and people react either like in awe mainly. There've been some people who have had very extreme reactions to these. Um, once or twice people have had to leave and have it taken off. There, um, so it's something that when we're doing this type of research, we always have to be very cognizant that not everyone has the same reaction you expect. So we have to be, um, you know, IRB is in place and we have to be very careful and warn people about issues. Uh, the nausea issue does come up for a, not a majority, but a certain percentage of the population, including my wife. Okay, so we gave them two writing tasks after they uh, involved in this. Um, they, using a hands writing heuristic. So, and then we revise writing prompts correspond to the reef migration VR simulation. The first was to look at art, it was to elicit an argumentative writing sample. Um, you're asked to write a letter to a fellow student explaining ways that the ecosystem could be interrupted and I'll go a little faster. The second was to do a summary of information on uh, ecosystems, you're writing a letter to a fifth grader uh, explaining uh, to their class of what they would miss if they had gone on this field trip. And um, we gave them some guidelines about how scientists talk and things like that. So measure reasoning flexibility is based on flexible reasoning rubrics um, and me measure lexical density. So we looked at these two things because we're looking at lexical density is really how many of the words that are, um, I'll, go, I'll jump ahead. How many were the personal content words that um, compared to the number of just total words? And the ideas of the higher lexical density plus the complexity of the writing could be equated to reasoning. To stand in, it's not necessarily 100% accurate, but it's a good look at how much they're thinking about the subject. Um, are they thinking in a more complex way about a, ecology and the reef and what they're trying to do? So um, I'm gonna jump a little bit ahead, except that um, the complexity of reasoning rubrics uh, were trained by two, re uh, two researchers. They had a 97% iterator reliability and the lexical density was um, scores were obtained by using uh, Analyze My Writing program, which is a free software program to see the lexical density. So we're looking at complexity, we're looking at lexical density, and we're looking at in terms of um, basically uh, argumentation and uh, summation of what they're experiencing. So the conditions, ah, talking a lot. Uh, we, one was that they did the VR environment by itself. So all they did is they went into the environment, sat on the reef, they experienced it, they did nothing else, and then they wrote those two things, the letter of the fifth grader and then the let, talking about uh, ecology. The next one was they read a, a, the text and then they did the writing. And the final one is, oh, it's, slightly weird in the wrong place. It should say that they did the VR and the reading, and then they went ahead and did the writing. So it's three different things. So VR writing, book writing, VR plus book, and then writing. Should fix that slide. So uh, in terms of complexity. So with looking at the VR and the book there um, versus VR and book only, there really wasn't much a difference in terms of complexity. So they seem to be about the same for both the summary writing and the argumentative writing. So the VR was a little bit higher on the uh, complexity for argumentative writing. So that's about the same across the board, which is really what most educational technology wants, at least it to be about the same. But when we looked at lexical density, like how much did they write? How, what were they writing? What were they writing about? What were the words they were using? You can see that there's a much greater difference. And the idea that the VR plus a book was much higher than VR only or book only. So ultimately the results are saying, and when we run an analysis, it, it holds um, accurate, is that 
VR only and book only are about the same. Like you're not getting much of a benefit in one or the other. But when you combine these things, we get a much greater benefit. And you could talk about the idea that the students can read something and then they go look and interact with it. And that helps them hang ideas on actual animals, aspects of the reef, aspects of ecology that they wouldn't be able to do with the text only, and they wouldn't really be able to do on VR. So with VR only, they have the experience, but they don't have the vocabulary. With the book, they have the vocabulary, but the experience with combining them, we get both. And this is something that comes up in education a lot. So when I talk about this, the VR experiences, one of the first things that teachers and teacher educators say is, well, we don't want to replace teachers. We don't want to replace text. We don't want to replace labs. And in no way are any of us saying that we should do this. As a matter of fact, this data says that we demonstrates we shouldn't do this. What we should be doing is including VR to supplement and buttress texts, labs, and lectures, all the formats that we're typically using. What VR does is it creates an environment and an experience for these students to engage in these activities, just like a field trip in geology allows you to get on the field or biology or environmental science. So I'm gonna stop for briefly for questions at this point. Um, because I have two other smaller studies and then a future study that I wanted to talk about. So if you look at the descriptive language, uh, use after VR versus other conditions. So we, there have been studies that I've been a part of besides this one that have looked at um, other conditions uh, in terms of descriptive use. Typically we look at things like um, VR versus serious educational games versus hands-on versus lecture. And we see that when we're looking at just those four things and not combining them, that uh, lecture is the lowest. Um, serious educational games, which are games that are designed to, uh, with an educational component in mind from the very beginning. Um, and hands-on typically end up being the same. And, but then um, VR environment versus serious educational games or hands-on typically has a statistically high, significantly higher um, levels on, on measurements such as this. Um, I, there, is, there should be more work however on descriptive language. The lexical density covers that a little bit, but not as well as I would like. The other study that we're starting to look into is looking at video, 2D video versus VR. Um, how is the novelty effect accounted for in this work? So, um, so one way that we do it is that before we start, um, having students just throw on the headset and then just go with it. We, you have students interact on a, in a VR environment and like do the kind of more game VR experiences for about 10 to 20 minutes. So they're used to it. Um, it's not like, oh my God, this is the most amazing thing in the world. It's getting more and more common that the novelty effect for younger kids isn't probably as important. Adults are still amazed, but adults are still amazed by Zoom, so, um, but it's a good question and it should be uh, probably accounted for more. I know that I have students purposely engage with the technology for a while before they actually, uh, I run a study, but I can't say for um, other researchers. Any other questions? Is it a wait time? Talking to myself. Okay, so, um, okay. Does it, oh, oh, good question, AG. Does it matter uh, book or VR first? So we did do that too on a different study. So it could book versus VR. It turns out actually there is some effect, the idea that um, doing the book first and then the VR does have some effect, but it's not statistically significant when we're in the study. Uh, how about a comparison with video use? Yes. So. Joy, that's actually exactly the next study that we're planning on doing, is looking at video use versus um, VR. So when we talked about video before, when we talked about lecture before, these lectures have always been videotaped and have had some components in it, but it hasn't been like, here's this video of Jacques Cousteau, you're on the reef, and here is the VR experience on the reef. So that has not been done. And it's something that actually I just had a discussion with this morning with some of the other researchers on why has this not been done yet. Um, have you or others read about 
have you or others you've read about compared to BR with a real experience using BR with language learners? So, so a researcher who is now going to be at Western Washington University and I are actually already looking into doing the real, the real experience versus BR. So he's a biology professor who is part of their Marine Institute. And he's going to go out and take students out and then at the same time make 3D films because we have the equipment to make 3D 360 VR films. So he's going to take students out and then we're going to then have students in the VR environment and then we're going to do comparisons in terms of writing and argumentation and learning. So great questions. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so a couple other studies that I've been working on that I've done in the past is one that utilizes something called Elements 4D, um, which is a, a product out of da from Daiquiri. So Elements 4D, as you see in the picture, basically what it does is it's augmented reality as opposed to virtual reality. So what it does is you have these cubes and they're basic cubes that you can just, that you can print up, anyone can print them at home for free, and you fold the cube together and on each side of the cube, as you see, there is an element. And there's six different cubes, so there are 36 elements. And each one has these kind of odd um, steampunky Baroque images on them. So when your phone or an iPad, when you look through one of these things, you, running the program, whatever element is on the top, the entire cube is replaced with that element in a glass box. So if we go back, you see these little glass boxes on the screen. Each, um, in reality, those are those two cubes that you see above the iPad. But when you look at it through the screen, it's replaced with H2O, with a little water, and then with a little information, of, or actually it's replaced with oxygen and hydrogen with some information. Researchers watching are doing physical, move, physical movements such as uh, moving subjects or things. Um, I'll get to that question in one second, because that's a, actually a very important question. So, um, so when you have these cubes, it replaces it with an element. And when you take an element of hydrogen in the cube and you move it next to the element with oxygen, they combine. And then when you combine oxygen and, and hydrogen, oxygen, and the two to one ratio, you get water. And both cubes are then replaced with water, as you see it here. So, basic, so you have 36 cubes, and they can react or not react depending on the elements. And you can see them. You can look around them. There's a little bit of information about them. And you can see which ones react and which ones don't react. And you can actually see the element in uh, whatever form it normally takes at room temperature. So um, this was very easy to conduct. We did, we, what we did is we did it in a Science 101 laboratory with 22 students, 20, mainly education majors with one DTC communications major and a business major, and mainly women. The majority, this Science 101 is on the Pullman campus. And I brought it to the Tri Cities campus, and basically it's an introduction to science um, that covers basics in chemistry, physics, environmental science, and geology. None of the students are science majors. Um, in this class, none of them were even going to get a certificate in science. We did a very simple pre-post test about basic ideas of covalent and ionic bonding. This test that uh, was written by the lab instructor that had nothing to do with the experience. So we had them take a pretest. We had them play with the cubes and answer a few questions about bonding and which ones bonded and what do the elements look like. And then, uh, then they took a post test and we got a statistically significant um, result in improvement on average with a moderate effect size, um, which is impressive considering the fact that in these types of environments simply you don't get an effect size from this. And a lot of, um, a lot of this is we're talking about the idea that it's, it's coming as a 3D manipulative. So, and it's something that they can actually see. Um, and that goes back to the question that I got on the private chat, were participants watching or doing physical movements such as uh, move subjects or things? So in the past one with the VR environment, they could interact with the objects. They could, uh, if you went, reach out and touch the sea enemy, it would react. You could freeze time, you could touch the fish and then fly away. Uh, for the elements 4D, they did manipulate the cubes. And you could move them around and everyone stood around with their iPads and they could see this manipulation and you brought different cubes together. You get different results. This leads into a discussion that I've been having with one of the researchers in Pullman about embodied cognition in VR. So there's been, there's a lot of data on embodied cognition. 
there's growing research in VR, but there hasn't really been a discussion of combining these two things. And with new haptic equipment for VR, we can look at the idea of um, embodied cognition in sciences and whether that's impacted in a VR environment. The typical example I use for this would be if you remember from physics from high school, um, they have the right hand rule where you take your one direction is the magnetic field, one direction is the um, ion, and one direction is the velocity. And you, you can figure out which direction it's going. There's like an embodied kind of combination. Or there are aspects in biology where the protein enters into a lock, and you'll see the professor in the biochemistry class say, well, it enters in, and it turns a lock, and it's allowed to go in. By combine, what I want to do is look at combining these physical actions that are typical in science classes with VR and seeing if we get any type of difference in learning um, either immediately or over time. Okay, so um, the other very brief subject, um, AR technology that we've been doing lately is called HP Reveal. And with HP Reveal, as you see on the screen, there are um, little signs and you can kind of see that there are little figures and when you bring up your iPad or your phone, whatever, it scans it and then if it sees the, um, the figure, it then replaces it with a short video or a three-dimensional object that you can see and manipulate. So this has, been, this has been used more and more in classes so you can have little animations when a kid goes around. So what we did is we examined the ease in which third grade special education students use this technology, the impact of the technology on learning, and whatever constraints they had. This was based on a previous study by McMahon, where you look at university students using the same technology where they would use their iPads and learn about anatomy. So they'd have these little pictures that bring up the iPad or the phone, and then an animation, an explanation or a video would occur, usually in 3D, about that particular bone or that aspect of anatomy. What we did is, and we took that technology and moved it down to third grade for special education students. And what we wanted to mainly see was, will it work? And then what are the constraints when you move something from a college environment to an elementary school environment? I'm very interested in this type of topic because I have a background in psychology. And in psychology, we know that the most commonly tested People in the, in the United States or college sophomores and a lot of psych, psychological uh, statements made about the world based upon that and not necessarily about the, the target population that curriculum was written for. Uh, long explanation. So what we did is we, we, it was a very short study with one of my doc students. She just went over uh, to the local, uh, local school, talked to um, with five students. She spent, the kids spent 30 minutes using technology and answered questions about anatomy and the technology. She then went back once a week and did some follow-up to see how long they remember it. And the main thing that we found about constraints is it turns out third graders are kind of short. So what we, the original study had all the kids looking at things that were, all the students looking at these things on tables. And all the kids were too short to look at the tables. So they, had, they couldn't reach and we had to completely redesign this. And this seems pretty minor, but we're talking about special education students with special needs. We're talking about um, the idea that we typically don't consider the physicality when we're looking at this type of environment. And that's what VR and AR is about to some extent. So that was kind of where we're going for that. This is still being coded qualitatively and with some quant. Uh, finally, the last thing that um, a, a future study that we're working on this summer has to do with social VR. So social VR is um, interacting with people across the room and around the globe in VR environments, which is now particularly topical to the fact that I'm giving this speech on Zoom. So it's the idea between, um, what are the students' disabilities? Uh, um, I'll get back to remember that question. So uh, with social VR, what we're talking about is not just interacting with VR that someone produces you, but creating your own VR environments to share with other people. Um, which is becoming a, a particularly topical. So an example is with social VR uses a program such as Rec Room, where everyone can go in with their headsets and then interact with other people using these avatars. And they see everything from their perspective that you can play. Rec Room was originally designed to literally as a recreation room. There was paintball and frisbee golf and uh, dodgeball. And it's, what has happened over time is that it's developed into a complete platform for kids to use. 
um, for kids and adults to use to create their complete own VR environment. So at a very low uh, threshold, anyone can go in and create a VR environment and have other people come in. So you could create a VR environment such as your entire house and other people could visit your house, this VR version of your house by being invited in, in by you. Um, VR chat is another platform that's using these. It's a little bit more complex when it comes to like what you look like in terms of an avatar, but it's the same idea that we're, these students are now, or these students, these kids and these adults that are making these environments in which to socially interact, which before the COVID-19 crisis, a lot of people are like, why would you do that? Now we're seeing that there might be a purpose for this more than just for socialization. Um, the, what you can, the reason I include these slides is, these two particularly, is what you can now download for a very low price. And what we're doing on the Tri-Cities campus is downloading kits, um, such as these two that are from Kitbash, and then creating a little town for people to come in, discuss, share data, actually about VR technology, and then interact in a VR environment, with, because now we can't do that. So the 2D environment of Zoom it, while well, it's incredibly useful, and I love Zoom, I should have bought stock, but the, it, it's missing this interaction that the social VR will provide more and more at a much lower price. But then what I want to do is research how is it that, how do we interact? In addition, I want to research how easy it is for kids to do this. So this is actually what it looks like besides the little model spinning around. To that end, there's something called Alice 3. So Alice, Alice was a program designed in the 90s uh, to create VR environments when VR, the kind of the first round of VR, and then it failed. Um, people didn't buy the VR, the technology was too expensive. It wasn't very realistic. So uh, Carnegie Mellon through an NSF funded grant has resurrected um, Alice. It's now called Alice 3. And so I've been discussing with Carnegie Mellon how we can get kids to actually design things to Alice 3. So if you look at the screen, you see that Alice 3 is essentially very similar to Scratch. So it uses the same object-oriented kind of programming at, at the surface level that any person with any interest could actually create their own VR environment. If you want then, you can <coughs> go down, uh, you can dig deeper and deeper in, into the programming if you like, but at whatever level you feel comfortable with. So what we're looking at is getting um, girls ages middle school through high school to learn programming in Alice 3 to create their own worlds for personal for their own personal world and also to answer questions about the environment and then teach younger girls how to <coughs> how to actually um, program so we have a mentoring system that should be continuous the reason uh, girls are selected for this is one they're um, low, they're definitely not engaged in computer science historically, and so it's a group that we want to encourage to do computer science in this type of way, and two, they're less likely to break my equipment, which boys at this age typically have done already, so it's better that way. Um, so those are the studies that I'm currently running besides the, my other computer science education work and uh, GIS studies with Dr. Um, Morrison. So I'm going to stop now. Dave Simon asked about a uh, question about transfer. <coughs> to what degree do students take their learning for a context to think about the real world or vice versa? That's a really good question. Um, you could, part of the original study talking about the argumentation would be about um, if I'm explaining environment to somebody else, the VR should be able to help. But I, I don't know. I can't necessarily answer that question, but it's something we could research and that we're pushing to research. Um, I do think that, that my hypothesis would be that they would have an easier time applying aspects of VR than they would aspects of text or lecture. So typically in science ed, we do a lot of in the, you know, it's a lab and it's, it, you don't really leave the lab and a lot of things don't transfer out of the lab, especially in terms of chemistry and physics. But uh, VR allows participants to do things a, that they would never be able to do. So one aspect would be that you can speed time up. And as a, someone with a geology degree, I'm very well aware that understanding deep time is very difficult for anyone, you know, geologists included, 
And the ability to see time on a grander scale through virtual reality is a benefit to understanding things like um, plant tectonics and um, evolution due to natural selection. In addition, they can see the very small and the very large in ways that you not you can't really do through a tax or a standard laboratory. And I think by doing those things, you, we would most likely see transfer, but we haven't necessarily uh, researched that specifically. How is it being used? So AGS, how is it being used, uh, used in astronomy and cosmology? Um, currently, there are several programs that, are, that use astronomy and cosmology within the VR environments. Uh, NASA has produced several very good programs that are downloadable through Steam about astronomy, including a one for the HoloLens, which is an AR equipment about going to the moon. In addition, I have um, various uh, moon models that then when you put AR on, will actually point out every crater for you and show videos of moon launching. The thing is, is that and there's not been very much research done in this area on what is the impact on learning. So as I said at the beginning of the lecture, there's, there are lots of programs out there but very little research on does it actually have an effect. <coughs> um, Jose Rivera says, are there any courses at WSU that deal directly with AR, VR applications, particularly in education? And other learning resources in Pullman, such as Don's uh, Vertigo Lab, but just trying to see where students can turn for more VR, AR learning. Well, Don is the best source in Pullman. I do know that there are other VR um, projects going on in their College of Engineering, because Don and I both partner with our individual colleges of engineering. Um, for instance, Don and I, with the Pullman College of Engineering, are working on a choose your own adventure experience for VR for students with autism. And then I'm, and I'm working with the College of Engineering here for the senior design team for a, a Missoula flood experience. But when it comes to education, typically, uh, for this type of stuff, you want to be talking to Don, uh, I want to be talking to Joy, and if you want to take a trip down to Tri Cities, that'd be great too. This summer, with the VR um, project for girls, I'm running, uh, five, hopefully, running 591, which is a research project. We're going to apply for a grant to be able to support this. So, Michael Dunn asks Is it possible to experiment with smells and virtual reality? You have the sense of involved in experience and taste. <clears throat> taste? No. I hope to God, no. Um, however, there have been experiences, that, there have been new headsets that want to do more things involving um, smells, um, sadly, disturbingly, and also things like a wind on your face that causes reactions. The taste thing, uh, I, I don't think so, but the smell thing is definitely there. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, and if you guys would like to ask me questions oh, that are not on, if I missed any, please tell me. Uh, Uduru asked a specific question about disabilities. The disabilities for um, the students, the, the students with disabilities, they were, um, they were learning disabilities. There were no uh, physical limitations on the students. It was basically, uh, as far as I know. So, any other questions? Any questions that aren't being typed at me? Sure, John, I'll yeah. ask one in person <laughs> or in, in <laughs> voice. Um, so I'm aware of some of the work like with serious gaming and the assessment systems that kind of reside underneath those and how they can be adaptive, you know, given the way kids respond in those environments. Um, can you talk a bit about, you know, what you see happening similarly with VR, where I can imagine you have an assessment system that's built underneath what kids are experiencing, how they interact with this, you're collecting data and able to tailor that environment or tailor the instruction that would go on in that environment based on how they're responding. Can you talk well, about yeah. the work that's going there, where, where we are with that? Well, right now, so the industry is using, collecting a lot more data than the than serious educational games. So imagine you're collecting all the data you would collect from serious educational games, plus, um, monitoring, um, direct monitoring of what you're looking at, physical reaction, time on task, um, choices. In addition, I have the equipment, uh, Don has the equipment to basically also monitor bio, uh, um, bio responses in terms of blood pressure, um, blood pressure, heart rate, perspiration can all be monitored with this equipment. So 
it's uh, it sounds kind of sinister what you can actually do, the amount of monitoring you can actually do, and the amount of things you can actually do with VR for this. So what we're looking at, um, kind of like if we look at um, what students are attracted to, what you're looking at, what you're not looking at, and part of that is just the technology itself, because the newer headsets, when you turn and look at something, that becomes highlighted and it low reses everything behind you. So by just that, that equipment alone allows me to then say, okay, well, the student was looking this way, the student was thinking it was um, spending this much time on a problem. So it's everything we do with serious educational games. Um, it's whether you have a developer's license or not. Don McMahon has a developer's license and I'm pursuing one too, that opens up can looking at this type of type of analysis for the, the, the physicality of it. Um, to put it, if, if you haven't used this VR equipment, it's much more immersive than people give it credit for. So continually I have people, and I've done this myself, who put down the handset on a tree stump that doesn't exist. Um, there's a famous little experiment that they moved somebody across a, a classroom without them knowing it by slowly adjusting. Every time they turn, they adjust the room a little bit. And he, we, he physically, without realizing, so consciously moved across the room and didn't know it. So the, there is such an immersive nature of this that we can kind of both measure everything and manipulate people in ways that we wouldn't be able to do that for good or evil. But it's definitely, it's definitely there. And we're just beginning to look into this. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. I mean, I could just picture we could, like we do with computer adaptive testing, you could have an adaptive environment to mm -hmm. respond to what we see, you know, how the child's responding, the students responding to the learning environment um, on the, based on that assessment and essentially right. have individual instruction, if you will, for people who need that based on the feedback. It'd be, much e it'd be much easier to do it because basically you're monitoring everybody. And so what, um, and we kind of do that a little bit now with some, so Lehigh, is doing much more work on GIS. And so uh, Judy and I are, part of, are now part of the GIS, the GIS grant, and they're, but they're also doing GIS embedded in, in these things. And they're looking at what students are looking at real time and then changing it as they go. So yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's very, it's very uh, easy to manipulate the environment rapidly for students. I mean, it happens anyway in a serious educational game in any game that w your choices matter and completely affect the game. Um, and you can, so for instance, the choose your own adventure for autism is exactly that, that we're tailoring it based upon actions that the students do. They go through basically a decision tree and we change what they're doing and then we have them do it again to practice. In this case, it's for social cues. So you can, I, the idea is that you have a student who doesn't understand social cues very well, and then they make decisions, and every time they make a decision, there's a result and so on, and then they get to practice it again and see the best way to do it. And then you could literally kind of, based upon that, make a profile of that student on what, how they react and to what they react to, and then you could then tailor a new program to, that would be, work upon those strengths in a way that you can't really do with a serious educational game. <clears throat> um, any other questions? Uh, this is Michael. So earlier when you talked about the the book and virtual reality and the, the interaction, um, the really different higher set of scores with their writing, did you get any feedback from those participants as to how they they felt or interpreted or or felt the benefit of those to get those two together i'm thinking of episodic memory which you know when we get to experience something mm -hmm. we retain it so much right. better so well so um not in that way what i'm more interested in, though it goes along with the retention in three and six months down the road so what we want to do is then say okay well you did this you know the classical example in a physics class that i used to teach Everyone gets an A on the exam and forgets all the data the next day. But we're seeing, and the hypothesis is that by having this experiential um, environment through VR, that they're more likely to retain the information three and six months down the line. So what we want to do is do the experiments again and then test the same students later. And 
then talk about what is it that you remember from the experience. Um, my concern is that it'd be that they remember the experience, but they don't really, they can't assign anything to it. They just remember this, this good or bad experience. So hopefully, um, which is where the text comes in. I'm absolutely certain if we just do VR, that they'll remember the experience where they'll have no ability to hang that on to something. But with the text, the, the hope is that, the, that they will buttress each other in terms of long-term learning. Well, just a quick comment. I'm thinking too, if you have teachers in the VR immersive environment with the students, I mean, I think the teacher's role is just as important as ever in terms of guiding that experience. So one example of that is that Don and I were pursuing, pursuing with another professor was actually Spanish and English tutoring with augmented reality, remotely with augmented reality. So one of the things that the augmented reality can do is it can basically, you, it, while it can put any object in front of you that doesn't really exist. So you, I, my example was you can all look at a globe there, but it can also put somebody else who's wearing a similar AR set in front of you also. So you could imagine that you're sitting in a room and in, in front of a table and across from you, your, men, your tutor, your mentor actually can appear to you. And then you can see each other across this table, though neither one of you is in the same place. And so that's, so they could experience the same augmented reality at the same time, but not be co-located. So it's actually, there's a term for that, the Microsoft coin called a hollow teleportation. Um, and they have some examples of it, but Don McNan and I are working on setting up both our labs to be able to do that with our equipment and then be able to talk. And then so one of the college ed professors wanted to say, well, how would this work with tutoring? And I'm like, well, let's find out. So with the virtual reality, yeah, you can have multiple people in the same environment and as coaches to walk you through it. And it's a much better version of Twitch, I suppose, where you have people that are actually a teacher can walk you through the environment and then ask you questions as you go, um, as opposed to a computer program that would be prompting you, or some combination of the two. Um, okay. Did I miss anybody? Disability. Okay. Any other questions, concerns, worries about this evil technology? No. So, um, so the technology that we're using is both cheap and, and expensive. So the AR technology is actually pretty accessible now. As I said, everyone has it on the phone. Even the current sets that I'm using in the lab are only a few hundred dollars each. Um, what our hope is that as the price point lowers, it'll be adopted. More. We were actually, this is now different. We were hoping it'd be adopted in classrooms as we go. The feeling that the discussion we're having now is that just like schools are now giving out um, Chromebooks, they could be giving out very simple but still effective VR and AR headsets. As a matter of fact, you can actually turn any phone into a VR headset with about with an $8 piece of equipment. And so that we could actually start engaging these students at home with these types of environments so they could either were allowed back to schools, come back to school and discuss kind of a flipped classroom sort of way, or that they could also be engaging with each other. In, in, and I mentioned this with the social VR, instead of through Zoom, through this VR environment while they're experiencing it together. So you can imagine the experience I described with the reef where everyone saw the whale, but you could now have like 10 kids in various locations all experiencing that whale at the same time and then being able to have that discussion. And, the, and then we can then look at, well, how does this discussion generate, it, how is that gonna be different than in a classroom? Um, one concern could be the divide between students learning in terms of access among different lines, SES, so, and ability to be immersed in environment. So as usual, the problem is, is that we overestimate the amount of access that students have to things such as the internet and computers. The, the um, TV has done a very good job at convincing us all that we have internet access and all at least a laptop and an incredibly powerful smartphone. And that's not really the case. The benefit is, is that schools can now afford to give these, take these home. I do know, because I work with NSF on, on um, grant reviews, that there is a push through NSF to support for rural districts. 
So rural districts are continually underfunded for this exact type of equipment. And NSF is very interested in funding people who want to get this type of equipment into rural schools because typically they have the, uh, the lowest SES and the lowest access to computer equipment and technology. That being said, you could, uh, you could imagine that once you have this technology, students taking ownership and creating their own virtual worlds would be very useful in terms of engaging students both in science education, so, uh, ed education in general, and also um, computer science which is one of the interests that um, WSU College of Ed has in generating more computer science education at K through 12 by training teachers. Any other questions in this awkward way? Oh, okay. Uh, finally, get the equipment, but what about teachers training on this technology? I'm thinking about, te I'm thinking about teachers that are not very happy using technology. Okay, so that's been an issue that <laughs> I run into with a computer science teaching education program, which is basically creating a certificate for teachers to teach computer science. So there is always, there's always some reticence about teachers engaging in technology and computer science and things like this. And that's always going to be a problem. I do think that by having, having teachers engage in a program such as Alice, where it's very low level, it's very easy to program, you can Gain, teachers can gain confidence. So WSU already sponsors several different educational technology and computer science workshops, at least over the summers. I've been involved in several of them and that can help teachers get involved. Um, I think it's more and more the fear of technology might be disappearing amongst teachers. I've had multiple teachers from around the area come to the lab, um, at least teachers that are involved in training other teachers in technology. So I think that it's getting out there. It just, I don't think people really realize how readily available this equipment actually is. Um, but we do do trainings for teachers on this technology and both Don up in Pullman and I down here will happily do this and as it appears more and more. Um, that's also the same for using this technology for the university. So Don Freeman, Don McMahon and I are both creating VR, working to create VR labs for at the college level also. And I think those can also be introduced into high school. Um, have you had administrators using VR such as principals at the building level? I have had some administrators come in. Um, typically with the gear up program, I have administrators bringing in students and more and more they're becoming interested in this. Every year that we teach educational technology, um, the ed ad group has one or two people taking it and then I have them every year every semester I do have bring them to the lab and have them start using it so I've had more and more interest outside of just the typical stem identified schools um, especially now that I have a classroom set of this equipment one of the um, projects that I'm working on is to get some of this equipment out to school so they can actually play with it and use it for curriculum and more than just like a little novel thing. So a lot of schools have 3D printers, um, but, uh, and unfortunately they're put into the corner. So what we're trying to do is develop a curriculum that utilizes this that we can then hand to administrators and hand to teachers. So it's not just something that might collect dust. And I think that's gonna be the really important um, push. Andy. So Jonah, we have about two minutes left before we have to end. Is there one last question that you see? Well, Andy raised his hand. Okay. I Andy. did. Yeah, thanks. Um, so this is, this is really cool. Uh, it's, it seems like really interesting uh, work and the, and the technology seems like it could be a, a quite a useful tool. Yeah. So, so one question I have is, so um, how, so, so with, with things like smart boards and, and whatnot that we're, we're kind of selling a similar thing, right? Like it's gonna give you a different experience. Mm -hmm. It's gonna allow the teachers to, to bring things to you visually that maybe you weren't able to do before. Um, they don't seem to have done a whole lot, yeah? Mm -hmm. Because it's, it seems to me the environment is still the same environment. Right. Uh, that is um, teacher controls. You know, they do what the, the, the kids do what the teacher says or they say, you know, I'm not gonna, yeah? <laughs> Um, uh, and so my question is, is like, how do you see this being used as a way to break down, uh, that control and maybe align education more with kind of humanity and like with, with human nature, 
because uh, it seems like particularly in middle school and high school, we're kind of going against that uh, yeah. opportunity for autonomy to grow. Uh, and, and it seems to me like this could go one way or the other on that. Well, I think that it's, uh, that's a really good, you know, I, I, it's interesting when you made the comparison to smart boards, because I do that all the time. So typically when I talk about smart boards, I like to point out to teachers and administrators, um, the average price of a smart board is about five, used to be about five to $6,000. For five to $6,000, I can outfit an entire class. But the thing about smart boards are they were still, they were, you're right, they're teacher, it was incredibly teacher centered. All a smart board is, is taking your computer and making a giant screen. You could do the exact, it's just a giant monitor for teachers to stand and do PowerPoint on. And I, I think that's what ultimately happened. I, uh, the, I guarantee you there are far more teachers with smart boards in their classrooms that use it to project movies and to actually use it as any of the techniques that you get, any of the, the applications. And you could blame a uh, failure of PD. You could blame the fact that it's not really fundamentally changing how teachers interact with their students. It's still teacher in charge, students listen, just like you pointed out. I think this technology has a potential, though not necessarily a guarantee, a potential to make, to individualize education in a way and hand it, make it much more student-centered than we've ever had before in terms of educational technology. I can also see it being used the other way in that everyone learns in their own little headset and they don't see other people and they're isolated. So it depends on the curriculum that's written that utilizes this. Because you could see the idea that you could have every student creating their own learning environment as they go. If a teacher and if a district or a, a, student, a building soup is willing to allow that to happen, but it requires very solid research and curriculum about what works using this technology. And the problem is, and I kind of started talking about this initially, that research is just now happening at a few places around the country. Because we have a lot of old school curriculum writers who are now using this type of thing and just writing the same old curriculum they had before and it just becomes teacher centered as usual. And a student just in passively engages in it. Um, so it's a good question. I, the only way that it can be looked at is by writing better curriculum and assessing the materials that are out there and seeing how we can improve them. I, I don't know if that answers the question because it's just, but it is something that we're trying to do, whether you're talking to Don, or I know Joy is doing this too, the idea that we're all kind of looking at how can, we, how can this be assessed in a way that promotes learning and autonomy, not just be another gimmick or gizmo that'll yeah. end up being like a whiteboard. Yeah, Jonah, thanks. I know we're, we're at time, so let me throw out a few thank yous, but what I'll say is, um, you know, Zoom can remain open, so anyone who wants to keep this conversation going, we can stay online and keep talking. I'm happy to stay for a few minutes as well. Um, but I did want to just say as we're ending, uh, thank you to you for, uh, for presenting the work today. I appreciate that. It's super interesting and certainly forward-looking. Um, and I see applauses going up and, and thumbs, so that's great. Uh, I'll clap out loud also. <laughs> Um, I, I'll thank uh, Laura and AG for helping organize this this year, uh, the research conversations. Uh, we've had four this year. Um, I know some of you have been in all of these. Um, Mike's here today, so thanks to Dean Trevison for being here. Uh, Jane Kelly's here again, and she's had her students come to all these. So thank you all for supporting this. Uh, the theme I've, I pick up on as we look through this, we've seen people talk about how we enhance learning performance uh, from looking at English language learners and literacy to motivation issues how we enhance physical performance, if you attended Chris Connolly's talk, um, how we enhance leadership performance um, uh, from uh, Kristen talking about this. Um, and now we're hearing about you talking about enhancing performance through VR. So it's really encouraging for me to see all the incredible work we're doing around really making our education system and health systems better through this work. So I just want to point that out and say thank you everyone for participating this year. So thank you. If you, if you do have interest in participating next year in terms of presenting, uh, please let me know. Send me an email and you know, I hope we'll do six to eight of these next year again, uh, three to four a semester. And I'd be happy to have people come back if you want or, um, or if you say, yeah, I'd like to share my work, I'd be happy to have you. So thank you very much. And, and I'll say we'll, we'll stay online as long as people want to talk. And I see some extra questions here. So if Jonah, you have time, that'd be great. Sure. Yeah, I, I definitely have extra time. And Yulia, um, 
So there are a number of LLT um, applicants interested in VR. Will there be opportunities for them to collaborate? Yes, actually Don and I are both are now affiliate faculty with LLT, um, which means more than just hopefully sitting on committees. Um, so both of us would love to have people collaborate in language. We're both interested. Obviously some of the work that I did in the past involves uh, language and writing um, and cognition. So we'd happily, happily do that. There is actually an applicant that that was the first question, like a very brilliant person with some publications already on their record asking the first thing, would I be able to do VR research? And um, I'm not sure they have a, an idea for a project. So if they just knock on your door and said, say, is there a project I can help you with? Oh, They're yeah. right now thinking about deterring uh, the admission because of the virus thing. So right. it could probably not be next year, but the following year, but they already have, like, I want VR. They know what they want during the um, application already. So I already, um, I do have projects that are um, just starting for the summer. Some were put on hold. There are several projects I did, I did not discuss today, um, just due to time. I think I ran out of time as, as it went. The, the first, I am, for 591 credit, I am actually looking for several people who want to help write a grant, essentially, and do a pilot study for, um, for what is it, 6 to 12 aged women in VR, like d designing their own worlds and sharing them. So that's, um, and that'd be a local statewide grant, but through OSPI, kind of similar to the ones with computer science and CSTEP um, for the certificate. In addition, um, the labs themselves, both for Don and I, are open for several different projects. So, for instance, I have a stereotype uh, threat project, and I have uh, symbolic, um, not symbolic, the uh, embodied cognition projects that are both basically open for students who want to run with them. In addition, if faculty have an idea, both labs are, I'm speaking for Don a little too much, so, uh, uh, but I'll, I will anyway, because I'm the associate. Um, for that one, the labs are basically open for faculty who want to use the who want to use the equipment for projects. So I've had some pretty good luck with DTC and engineering so far, and Don has had pretty good luck also with faculty from within College of Ed and outside of College of Ed coming in and saying, "Hey, I'm interested in this. What can we do?" And we arrange a way to do it, and um, either we are paid in, uh, to support the lab through grants or we're paid in the coin of the realm, which is publications on developing um, these projects. So I'm happy to do it. Uh, I, some of you know either Don's lab uh, or mine, they're essentially equivalent. I also have a bit more 3D printing equipment and an EEG currently. Um, he has more augmented, I have more virtual. It just, but we both have a combination of the two. Thank you, John. I feel better. I already told them that there are labs both on, on Pullman and on our campus. So I feel better that there are actually things for them. Right. And the whole point <laughs> they're coming into play with. <laughs> that they don't have to be in the physically in the lab. I mean, Don and I both have the equipment and to have 3D virtual discussions with each other from wherever we are. So one of the, you know, as we all, this, as we were, we were all happily discovering, it is not actually as necessary to be on campus as we thought it was. Well, now with the equipment that we have, um, and actually I'm, I'm currently working on this with the IT group on Tri-Cities, where we are literally developing kind of like a small Mercado area that's virtual, that people can come in who are interested in, the re in this type of research, walk around, interact with other people, pull data off, um, but it's much more than just a Google Doc. I mean, right now we're kind of stuck with Zoom and Google Docs and we're losing something in terms of this interactivity. This would happily or hopefully add to the interactivity that currently we're kind of losing with Zoom. And when this crisis is all over, I think it'll hopefully continue. I mean, not the crisis, but the, the idea of using this type of technology to um, connect people. Thank you, Jonah. Mm -hmm. Um, so Jose just typed me a message though I just saw him. Um, I've been exploring uh, pictographic VR applications to teach second language pronunciation. Don is on my, on my committee too, by the way. Just putting myself on your radar screen. Okay, well, that wasn't a, I thought it was a question. But yes, 
Um, Don and I are both serving on several LLT committees together. We're doing this type, um, we both basically confer about all our projects when he's not dealing with Roar, which is taking a lot of his time right now. So, anything else? Yes. Um, if you guys want, I, um, if you're interested in this type of equipment and you're, I can, I've discovered I can send things to interdepartmental mail. We could arrange to loan out equipment and try it out too. So I'm learning stuff about the schools or I was learning stuff about the schools. Um, it's definitely a resource that if somebody wants to check out the equipment, take it home, see what it's actually like. Um, and maybe that'll spur some ideas on what they might want to do research wise. I'm all for it. I'm as, um, as long as, you know, if you, you break it, I'll be depressed, but, uh, it's definitely, it's pretty hardy equipment, especially this stuff. And it's, I'm telling you, if you haven't used it before, it's definitely a new experience. And hence the question about novelty effect. There is one, um, and it's pretty, pretty extreme. I've watched people completely do somersaults walking on virtual I uh, like I beams um, it's it's it and that visceral experience I think is what's adding to the the learning more that you can't get from 2d or text I'm gonna turn on the oh, oh. thank you guys for coming and for the little clappy symbol you <laughs> um, I, uh, if you guys have any other questions, great. If not, uh, right now, please email me. Um, uh, and I'll happily discuss it. All right. All right. Okay. Thanks, Jonah. Thank All you, right. everyone. Thank you, guys. Thanks yep. for providing the opportunity, too. Yep. Okay. I'm just going to end the meeting now.